In this lecture, we'll be discussing cell membranes. This material is found in chapter 11 of the book. Uh, the title slide really kind of shows a, a depiction of a, a membrane and all the, the various pieces that you find in the membrane. And as we'll learn today, there's uh, a lot more than just the, the phospholipids that make up the membrane. Specifically, what we'll be talking about, first we'll go through some, some composition uh, of membranes, detailing the, what phospholipids are in them, um, sterols, and also proteins. Okay, the, all three of those make up um, membranes. Okay, it's not, not simply just lipids. Um, then we'll talk about the dynamics of membranes, and they're actually very fluid structures and we'll introduce what's known as the fluid mosaic model. And then finally, we'll talk about transport. And transport, um, there are a few different types of transport we'll, we'll cover. Um, basically, how membranes allow certain things to go through them and how they keep um, certain things inside or on the outside. First, we'll go through some um, review questions from chapter 10 material. Okay, and the first review question, rank the following fatty acids from the lowest to highest melting points. So think back to chapter 10 material, remember what affects the melting points. Right? Um, it might be helpful to pause the lecture and, and work through this for in a, a couple minutes. Right, so we have 20, 0, 21, delta 12, and 23, uh, delta 12, 15, 18. So let me select my pen. Okay, and if you remember, how are melting points affected? Well, they're affected by chain length and they're affected by the number of double bonds. And in this case, all three of these have the same chain length. They're all 20 carbons long. Okay, so that's not going to be uh, affecting these. Okay. And I'm just going to call the these, we're going to call that one, this two, and this fatty acid three, okay, uh, for simplicity. So which one of these has the lowest melting point? Okay. And if you remember, low melting point means they're, they're more fluid. They're going to be, um, at a given temperature, it's going to be more, more in the liquid phase, okay. So the number of du double bonds, as that increases, the melting point decreases. Okay. So three is actually gonna have the lowest melting point. Okay, because it has three double bonds. Two only has one double bond, so it will be next. And then finally, one will have the highest melting point because it, it has no double bonds, it's saturated. Okay, second review question. Draw the mixed triglyceride with 12, 0, 14, 1, delta 10, and 16, 3, delta 7, 10, 13. Okay, so this, this question, um, probably not going to see this on an exam, although I guess I could ask you to draw this and, and submit it electronically. Um, but if we had to do that, let's, let's think back to how, how a a triglyceride works. Well, we have first the, the, the backbone of this is a glycerol. And if you remember, there's actually three carbons in a glycerol. And I might as well draw these hydrogens in explicitly, although you don't really need to. Okay. Sorry, when I put my hand down, it makes marks on the screen. Okay, so glycerol would normally have three alcohol groups on it. Right, so those would be OHs um, normally for glycerol. 
but in a, a triacylglycerol or triglyceride, those are going to be connected to the carboxylic acid via an, an ester linkage. Okay, so we can draw our first fatty acid here. Okay, this will we'll put 12 zero uh, at this point. So that's carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, and that one doesn't have any double bonds, so it, it's pretty easy to draw. Okay, next we'll do 14 one delta 10. Okay, we draw our ester linkage. And now we draw our chain, 14 carbons long, a double bond at position 10. Okay, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We make our double bond, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. And then finally, we have 16, 3, delta 7, 10, 13. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Double bond. 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16. Okay. So that's basically how you would draw a, a try. Well, um, a triglycerol, triacylglycerol, or triglyceride. Right, so if you if you were, you know, a possible online exam question, um, right? If you're doing a, a paper exam, you could, you know, expect to have a question to draw one of these, I guess. Um, but for an online exam, uh, I could ask you, uh, give you a, a structure of one of these, and then have you name all three of the, the fatty acids in it, I suppose. Okay, and then last review question, name these lipids. All right, so this, this might be um, a point where you'd want to pause and, and see if you can name all of these. Okay, if we go through this um, A, okay, what is this? Well, it has a choline as a head group. But you'll notice also there's a very short uh, acyl, uh, acetyl ester here at, at position two, and there's an ether linkage here. So if you remember um, what this one is, it's platelets activating factor. Okay. Right. Let's look at B. B has uh, a phosphocholine as a head group, okay. and a an amide linkage here, okay? And we don't have a, this isn't really a fatty acid here where we have an alcohol sticking out. So if you remember, this is actually sphingosine, this part of the molecule right here, uh, with the amide linkage and the, the phospho head group, that's sphingomyelin. Okay. Uh, C, this is um, cholesterol, or I believe um, the slide this came off of was actually 7-deoxycholesterol, uh, something like that. Um, the one that, that is a precursor to vitamin D, but really if you see this structure, you can, in this, this chain here, you could just think of this as cholesterol. Um, D, uh, phosphocholine head group, and these are ester linkages. So this is what we would can call phosphatidylcholine. E, uh, this is a cartoon picture, uh, and I wouldn't expect you to know uh, the exact name of this. This is an uh, A antigen in the blood group, but what it is is this, if you remember this kind of cartoon depiction here, we have one fatty acid. This is sphingosine, so this is a, uh, and sugars here, so it's a glycosphingolipid. All right, F, F, this, this lipid here it, highlighting the cis uh, double bond configuration between 11 and 12. This is 11 cis retinal, okay? Uh, 
uh, involved in site. Okay. And then the head groups, if we go through, if we can name these, right, we have two carbons and a amine group. So that's ethanol amine, two carbons, then the nitrogen with methyl groups around it. And again, that should have a plus charge. The, the book figure does not show that, but it does have a plus charge. That's choline. Here we have uh, serine, glycerol, and uh, phosphatidyl and inositol. So that this would be the inositol head group, which I wouldn't really expect you to know this one. Okay, moving on to chapter 11. So what are membranes? Well, they're complex lipid-based structures that form pliable sheets. Okay. They're composed of a variety of, of lipids and proteins. Um, some lipid membranes, um, excuse me, some membrane lipids and proteins are, are glycosylated, meaning they have sugars attached to them. Okay, all cells have a cell membrane. You know, that's what makes them a cell. It separates the cell, the, in, the interior of that cell from its surroundings. Okay. Eukaryotic cells have other membranes inside them. It, they have internal membranes that sort of divide um, in, into organelles that are inside the, the cell. Okay. All membranes have three important properties. Okay. One, they are flexible. Okay. They have to be flexible because they need to permit shape changes, right? Cells have to be able to grow or they have to be able to move. So they need to be flexible. If, you're, if your membrane was rigid, they would just break apart and, and spill the, the contents, right? So they need to be flexible, right? The uh, second property, important property, Membranes are self-sealing. Okay. They, that means two membranes can come together to form one, to fuse together, and that's a process known as exocytosis. Membranes can also undergo fission, that is they can, they can divide into two. Right? And so cell division, that's very important. Uh, the fact that membranes can be um, divided into two separate compartments. Okay. And finally, the third important property, they are selectively permeable. They retain certain compounds inside and they exclude other compounds from the outside. Okay. That's, that's really important because if, if they weren't, um, if there wasn't some selectivity in them, the contents inside would be the same as the contents contents outside, and that you know re really wouldn't be um, conducive to life. This picture shows how many membranes are inside a, a eukaryotic cell. We have uh, the plasma membrane would be sort of on the outside of this, but this is showing all the membranes inside. You have the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, nuclear membrane. Mitochondria have their own membranes. Uh, and then there's other um, compartments within the cell that, that contain membranes, like these, these secretory granules. Okay, so there's a lot of membranes going on inside a eukaryotic cell. Okay. Functions of membranes. Well, first and foremost, it defines the boundary of the cell. Okay, the, the outside plasma membrane gives the, the cell its, its shape and its boundaries. Okay. They also allow the import and export, okay. and that goes back to that, that property of being selectively permeable. Okay. They can selectively import things like nutrients, right, you need to get into the cell, and you can selectively export things like uh, waste products um, from metabolic pathways and, and also toxins. Another function of membranes is that they retain metabolites and ions within the cell. Okay, that still goes back to being selectively permeable. Okay. Membranes can sense external signals and they can transmit that information into the cell. And we'll talk more about this in, in chapter 12, signaling pathways, but things like um, 
like an external signal or external hormone or growth factor can reach the outside of a cell uh, membrane. And that signal can be conduced to inside the cell nucleus and a specific gene then can be expressed. Okay. So, and membranes, you know, help facilitate this process. It's sort of um, where that process starts for, for the cell. Okay. Another function, they provide compartmentalization within the cell. Okay. And you can think of this as being that, that kind of self-sealing property. And that's important because you can separate energy producing reactions from energy consuming ones, right? If you have these reactions you know, right by each other, it, it'll be kind of like a feudal cycle. You're, you're producing energy and using it um, all at once. And that's not always good. So um, you'll, you know, like the ATB producing reactions inside of mitochondria, right? Those are within the mitochondria. Okay, and they're they're separated from reactions that where you would be using that that ATP energy. Okay. You can also keep uh, proteolytic enzymes, so enzymes that that digest proteins away from the uh, important proteins that need to be that that you want to protect from being degraded at at a particular time. Some common features of membranes, they're sheet-like, flexible structures, um, approximately 30 to 100 ang angstroms thick. So that's a, a pretty big, big um, range of, of thicknesses. Okay. The main structure is composed of two leaflets of lipids, and we call this a bilayer. We'll see pictures, pictures of this in a second. Okay, so membranes are, are usually um, for the most part, you can just assume that all membranes are, are actual bilayers. We did mention um, the archaebacteria in Chapter 10 when we looked at lipids from them. They're actually a monolayer, but they're, their monolayers mimic the, the bilayer that, that are seen in all the other membranes. Uh, membranes form spontaneously in aqueous solution. Okay. There, so there's no enzyme or machinery needed to build the, the membrane, it forms spontaneously. And that's primarily due to the hydrophobic effect, which we've, we've discussed. Okay. Uh, protein molecules are present in the membranes, in, in all membranes, and some protein molecules can span the entire lipid bilayer. Right. Membranes are asymmetric, and that, that what we're meaning there is that um, some lipids are found mostly on the inside of the bilayer, on the inside of the cell. Some lipids are found on the outside of a bilayer or the outside of the cell. Um, carbohydrate are always on the outside of a cell. So if you, the uh, glycosylated uh, lipids or proteins are going to be on the outside of the cell. Okay. Uh, membranes are also asymmetric in that they can be electrically polarized. And, and, and typically the inside um, would be the negative um, um, side. Right. They are fluid structures. Okay? And you can think of them as kind of a, a two-dimensional solution of oriented lipids. And that's where this fluid mosaic model comes in. Right? It was proposed in the early 70s. Okay? And what it states is that lipids form a viscous two-dimensional solvent into which proteins are inserted and integrated. Um, you can also think of it just in, in simple terms, the fluid, fluid mosaic model uh, is proteins are in a sea, floating in a sea of lipids. Okay, that's really a, a simple way to, to state the fluid mosaic model. Okay. Uh, integral proteins are firmly associated with the membrane. Oftentimes they span the entire bilayer. Peripheral proteins are more weakly associated and can be removed easy, uh, fairly relatively easy 
right? Um, some are non-covalently attached and, and others are um, covalently attached to lipid, lipid membranes. Excuse me, uh, membrane lipids. Okay. So a very cartoon sort of depiction from the book of the fluid mosaic model, right? We have the, the polar head groups of our membrane lipids. Uh, these would be phospholipids are shown here in blue. Okay, and the hydrophobic tails are shown in yellow. Okay, so this would be one bilayer, and this one faces the outside of the cell. And another bilayer uh, is shown here, and the, the, uh, the head groups face the inside of the cell. Okay, so this is what we mean by bilayer. Right? The hydrophobic tails face each other on the two layers of this. So you have a, the outside and the inside surface are polar and the middle of the bilayer is nonpolar. Okay, and then we have various uh, membrane proteins, which we'll talk about in some more detail. But here you have one that's an integral membrane protein. It has a, a helix that spans the entire length of the bilayer. And then you have a, an example of a peripheral protein that's just associated with the, the polar head groups of the membrane. So the composition of membranes. Well, as we've as we saw in that that picture there, there's going to be a um, component that's lipid based and a component that's protein based. Okay. Uh, the composition of membranes is going to be different. It's different in different organisms. Uh, it's different in different tissues from the same organism, and it's also different in 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 the different organelles within a single cell. Okay. What changes? Well, the ratio of lipid to protein can vary. The type of phospholipids can vary. Uh, abundance and types of, of certain sterols uh, varies. For instance, prokaryotes, um, bacteria, really don't have any sterol in their membranes. Okay. Um, cholesterol is very prominent in plasma membranes in our cells, uh, but it's, it's really almost absent in our mitochondria. Okay. Uh, galactolipids, so lipids that have sugar groups attached, are abundant in plant chloroplasts, but they're really almost absent in, in, in animals. Okay. Um, this table here, you don't have to know any of these values, but it just shows you the, co the components by weight percent uh, of, of various membranes. Okay, so myelin sheath here, we have 30% protein, 30% phospholipid, and you know almost 20% sterile, in that sterile being cholesterol. Okay. Um, then you can see there, you know, they, they do change. Uh, and E. coli, for instance, it's almost 75% weight protein in its membrane and only 25% weight phospholipid, right? So the amount of protein in, in a membrane is actually very, very high. Here's another figure uh, showing this more graphically how the composition of membranes can, can change. Okay, and the, these are looking at different organelles. Um, in looks like rat liver cell membranes. Okay, so here's the, the plasma membrane. A, in, in orange is cholesterol. So it has a huge um, component of, of cholesterol in, the, in, that, in that membrane. All right, and blue is phosphatidylcholine. Uh, the darker blue is phosphatidylethanolamine. Uh, some minor lipids. And then green is sphingolipids. So you can see that there's, there's um, you know, the plasma membrane has a lot of sterols. Mitochondrial membranes hardly have any, okay? And they have this red component, which is, which is cardiolipin, okay? Um, so really the, the point here to make is that different organelles are going to have uh, fairly drastically different membrane compositions, Uh, another way membranes are asymmetric is that, uh, or that they can differ, is they can be asymmetric 
from the you know inside of the inside mono layer and the outside mono layer and this figure shows that so uh, this part of the plot is the inner mono layer this part of the plot is the outer mono layer and you can see that the they're they're actually quite different in composition right um, the outer leaflet typically has more of a positive charge okay and that's reflected here with phosphatidylcholine and, and sphingomyelin both of those have a, a po an overall positive charge to them okay and they they make up you know the majority of the outer monolayer <clears throat> um, phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine are the neg overall negatively charged amino acids and you can see that they um, are, are in a higher um, amount on the inside monolayer. Okay. And that's um, not by accident. Okay. That's, that has some biological significance to it. And when you see phosphatidylserine going to the outside monolayer, that has some signaling implications. Okay. So one, um, depending what kind of a, a membrane you're, you're in. If it's in a platelet, phosphatidylserine on the outside will activate blood clotting. Other cells, when phosphatidylserine makes it to the outside in, in a large amount, that marks the cell for destruction, for, for apoptosis. And it's kind of another um, figure uh, showing this. So on the, if we look here, the outside um, mono layer, we're going to have more um, sphingolipids, um, more positively charged lipids, and more uh, cholesterol or sterol. The inside is going to be predominantly phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine. Okay, so that's on the the plasma membrane, the outside membrane of the cell. The inside membranes, these vesicles, they're kind of going to be reversed. Okay, if you'll notice, they're uh, the outer um, membrane of the vesicle is actually looks like the, the inner membrane of the plasma membrane, right? And that's so they can associate with each other um, uh, when, they, when they connect, okay? And on the inside, that's where we're going to get, you know, the, the positively charged head groups in the, in the cholesterol, Right, and in, in a similar um, uh, with the Golgi body, okay. So all membranes are are have some asymmetry to them. Okay. If we look a little bit closer at membrane proteins now, okay, and this this figure kind of gives us an overview of of what we we have. Um, we're gonna sh we're gonna see throughout this lecture, some examples of um, proteins that span the entire membrane and some that have channels through them that can, can actively pump things um, from one side to the other or just allow the diffusion of, of things through them. Then there are some that are you know, buried in one side of the membrane or span the entire membrane. Um, in, in various ways, we'll see different examples of those. And then we have things that are, are peripheral proteins that are only associated with um, one, one face of the membrane and not actually buried inside of it. Okay. So some functions of proteins that are in membranes. Well, you can have receptors, okay, and those detect signals from outside the cell, okay, some various um, receptors are shown here some examples um, a light receptor um, known as opsin you can uh, have hormone receptors uh, like the insulin receptor uh, neurotransmitter um, acetylcholine receptor is an example of a neurotransmitter uh, uh, pheromones things um, like taste and smell receptors um, would be examples okay. you can also have channels gates and pumps Okay, so um, nutrients, um, ions, the potassium ion channel and sodium ion channels. And, and then also things like um, a neurotransmitter, a serotonin reuptake protein will, 
acts to to pump serotonin back into the cell right um and finally enzymes we don't really see many examples of these but some enzymes can be membrane proteins and in metabolism you'll talk about atp synthesis and that the ends enzyme for atp synthesis would be an example uh, of an enzyme being um, uh, associated with a membrane being a membrane protein okay. this is the figure from your book showing showing membrane proteins Okay, um, we're going to look at these uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, peripheral membrane proteins. Okay, they associate with polar head groups of the membranes or charged regions uh, of integral membrane proteins. So in this example, we have a, a positive charge region of this integral membrane protein, and this peripheral protein is associating with that. They're relatively loose, loosely associated with the membrane um, through ionic interactions uh, with either the lipids or, or the domains of other proteins. And because they're, uh, they're sort of loosely associated, they can be removed by um, fairly um, gentle conditions if you disrupt the ionic interactions either by adding you know higher salt concentrations or changing the pH you can get these peripheral proteins to be released so if you're if you're trying to um, purify a peripheral membrane protein things like adding salt or changing the pH you can can purify you can remove those peripheral proteins and then purify them right um, when you do purify a peripheral membrane protein, they're not, they're, they will no longer be associated with any um, lipids. Okay. The other type would be an integral membrane protein, and those, those are ones that are buried in, in the membrane, in the hydrophobic region of the membrane. Okay. They can span the entire membrane. So this example here would be a protein that spans the entire membrane and it has a portion that sticks out on each side. Okay. They have a symmetry just like the membranes do. So different domains will, will um, face different compartments. Okay. So there, they are, um, there's a directionality towards these integral membrane proteins. Okay. They're very tightly associated with the membrane. And that's because they have hydrophobic stretches in the protein that interacts with the hydrophobic regions of I I inside that membrane bilayer. So in this case, this integral membrane protein, this yellow part of it is the hydrophobic region, and it associates very strongly with the hydrophobic region of the bilayer. Okay. To remove an integral membrane protein, that requires the addition of detergents. Okay. And detergents are or molecules that have a, a very hydrophobic part and a hydrophilic part. So if you add enough detergent, what that's going to do, it's going to act to pull a protein out of a membrane because the hydrophobic parts of the detergent can stick to the hydrophobic part of the protein. And then that, that hydrophilic part of the detergent can, can be um, water soluble. So it really acts to pull that out and, and solubilize that protein. Okay, so the detergents are similar to the phospholipids, but um, they're maybe a, a little bit uh, shorter, smaller, okay, easier to, to solubilize. Okay. A purified integral membrane protein is still going to have phospholipids or, and or detergents associated with them okay, to be soluble. They'll, so when you purify an integral membrane protein, it, it'll have this sort of detergent um, um, micelle around it, okay? So it, it's not ever, you know, to get rid of that. The, in a sense, if you got rid of that, the protein is going to fold differently to, to have that hydrophobic region not exposed to the polar solvent, okay? And it'll fold differently and, and likely precipitate out of solution. Okay, an example of an integral membrane protein that we've talked about already in this class is, is bacteriodopsin. Okay, and this one, um, 
it, this is the, the 3D crystal structure of bacteria or dopsin shown in a kind of a cartoon membrane. Okay, there's the C terminal will stick to the inside of the cell and the, the N terminal will be on the outside of the cell. So there's a directionality to it. Okay, and um, really don't need to know too much about this protein um, specifically other than it is an integral membrane protein. And those seven helices uh, span the, basically span the entire length of the membrane. Right, there are six types of integral membrane proteins, depending on, you know, the directionality they have or how many times they span the membrane. Okay, type one is a, a protein that spans the entire the length of the membrane, and has the C terminal inside the cell. Okay, and, and the N terminal outside. Uh, two is the opposite, type two. The N terminal will be inside, the C terminal will be outside. Type 3 integral membrane proteins are those that have multi, uh, sub, um, multi regions that span the, the membrane. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five helical regions, and they're all in the same polypeptide chain. Okay, so that's type 3. Okay, jumping to type 5. Very similar to type 3, we have multiple membrane-spanning regions, but they're all on different polypeptide chains, right? And these polypeptide chains just associate together to form um, a, a complex that the, the integral membrane protein needs to, to function, okay? So these are multimeric type 5. Okay, type 4 are those that have... Uh, a phospholipid anchor, okay? So they're anchored into the membrane um, by a phospholipid, and the protein part is, is almost exclusively uh, either on the inside of the cell, um, probably most of the time, type four here, are the, the protein's gonna be facing the inside of the cell, okay? But they're, they're considered integral because they have a hydrophobic anchor, okay, as opposed to being a, a peripheral protein. They actually have a, a piece of them buried in the membrane. So they're, very, they're harder to remove. You can't just add, you know, uh, high salt concentrations to remove that. Okay, and then finally, type 6. I don't know if you'll see any examples of these, but these have, you know, a protein that spans the membrane, and then another region that's anchored into the, the membrane uh, via a uh, hydrophobic interaction. Okay, so amino acids in membrane proteins are themselves sort of asymmetric. They cluster in different distinct regions. Okay, and as you'd expect, charged residues tend to cluster on the, the, the aqueous exposed, so the, either the inside or the outside portions of those integral membrane proteins. So charged residues are shown in blue, and you can see for the most part, they're, they're facing either inside the cell or outside the cell. Okay. Um, hydrophobic amino acids obviously would be, you know, in this region where the the hydrophobic tails are inside the bilayer. What's not, what might not be as, as obvious though, tyrosine and tryptophan tend to cluster at the nonpolar and polar interface. So tryptophan here is in red, tyrosine in yellow, and you can see that they're, you know, very much focused uh, almost in some of these proteins, almost like a line right where that, the, interface in the membrane between the, the polar head groups and the hydrophobic tails is, okay? You can think of those as forming kind of a seal, uh, like a grease seal or something, right? They're big aromatic side chains, um, primarily hydrophobic, although tyrosine does have um, an OH group on it. But they, that those those big sort of ring structures are good to 
make a a sort of a seal if you like think about it that way from the aqueous portion to the hydrophobic portion okay now let's talk about some physical properties of membranes so we talked about the composition um, now let's let's look into the the physical properties okay membranes are very dynamic structures and very flexible structures and that's remember that's one of the the important um, characteristics of membranes is that they are flexible okay? they can exist in various phases and undergo phase changes actually okay? they're not permeable to large polar solutes and ions okay? and that's that comes back to them being selective so big polar molecules and ions can't readily pass through a membrane. They are, however, permeable to some small polar molecules and nonpolar compounds. Okay? And that, again, goes back to them being sort of selective. Okay? Permeability can be artificially increased by some chemical treatment, and this is um, a way that we can get DNA into to certain cells. Okay, we can we can add DNA with a certain chemicals that makes it easier to pass through um, membranes, and that's in the lab. That's um, how we do some some bioengineering uh, to study the effects of of certain genes inside cells. Okay. Let's talk about the phases of membranes. Okay, depending on the composition and the temperature, lipid bilayer can be in in what we think of as two different phases, a gel phase or a fluid phase. The gel phase is um, more like a solid. Okay? Individual molecules don't move around or don't move around as much. In the fluid phase, the individual molecules can move around you know, f fairly freely. And heating causes the phase transition from the gel to the fluid phase. Okay? Under physiological conditions, membranes are more fluid-like than gel-like. Okay, so they're more liquid-like than solid, um, and that's important because they have to be—they have to have some fluidity to them for proper function. Okay, and just saying, um, you know, gel or solid, uh, and a you know, liquid or fluid phase, you know, either or is a little bit simplistic. As we'll see, there there really are a kind of a mixture between the two phases. Um, but the book gives these, these two pictures of this. So, and, and they call it uh, a liquid ordered state, okay, and a liquid disordered state. So the liquid ordered state, you could think of as being like the, uh, more like the gel state or a solid state and a liquid disordered state would be uh, like a fluid fluid state true fluid state okay okay and there's you know this as temperature increases you go from a more solid like or liquid ordered to a more disordered or fluid like um, state okay and there's some some transition here okay and it turns out that in under physiological conditions, membranes are really kind of floating along in this this transition region. So they're they're not not completely solid or gel like, and they're not really completely fluid or disordered. Okay, they're they're kind of a mixture of these two phases. Okay, what what influences this this fluidity of membranes it's mainly by the fatty acid composition okay. more fluid membranes require shorter and more unsaturated fatty acids okay. and remember the difference we sort of talked about that at the the first review question in this lecture right um, increasing chain lengths of the fatty acids is going to um, going to lower, um, or excuse me, raise the, the melting point. Okay. So at, at higher temperatures, cells need to have more saturated fatty acids or longer chain fatty acids. Okay. And that's to maintain integrity. 
you can't have, if you get too fluid, your membrane's going to be, you know, too leaky um, and it won't have the integrity needed. Okay, so at higher temperatures, you're going to have to have more saturated fatty acids in those membranes or longer chains. Okay, and at lower temperatures, uh, the opposite is true. You're going to need to have more unsaturated fatty acids or shorter change. And that's to maintain some fluidity. Because if the membrane gets too, too solid or gel-like, um, things can't move around like they need to. And this table, obviously, you don't have to memorize these, but it, it shows you, it's pretty interesting. This is uh, the composition of E. coli cells grown at different temperatures. And here are a list of the different fatty acids found in the membranes. Okay. And you'll see that uh, these two are unsaturated fatty acids. These two are saturated. Okay, So as we raise the temperature, the percentage of our saturated fatty acids increases right that's to maintain integrity okay as the temperature decreases you can see that the the unsaturated fatty acids the percentage there increases and that's that's to maintain um, uh, fluidity All right. right another very important molecule in terms of of membrane dynamics are sterols and in the case of eukaryotic cells uh, or animal cells like we have, uh, cholesterol is that sterile. Okay. And sterols like cholesterol help maintain rigidity and decrease permeability. So they're sort of twofold. Right. And other organisms um, like plants and, and fungi have their own uh, versions of cholesterol. Um, different types of sterols. All right, so how does this, how does cholesterol work? Well, it's very planar and it has very hydrophobic, um, that, that steroid um, nucleus there is very hydrophobic. So they kind of position themselves um, almost like plates between uh, the fatty acid chains of the phospholipids. So they can kind of stack in between there. Okay. Cholesterol does two things, and they're sort of kind of opposites of each other. Okay. In one sense, it helps prevent the, the crystalline or, or gel or liquid ordered. Um, all of those mean the same thing. Um, it helps prevent that state. Um, and you can think of that kind of as, as lowering the melting point. Okay. It also increases membrane packing through this, this interaction with the phospholipid fatty acid chains. Okay. And that reduces membrane fluidity and that helps also to prevent leaks. So in, in a sense that raises the, the melting point. So it kind of, it both lowers the melting point and raises the melting point, which is weird. Okay. Um, I'll explain that in, in a second here. Um, the other thing it does is it's important in the formation of what are known as lipid rafts, which we'll talk about. There's certain regions in, in, the, in the membrane that are, are sort of more ordered and they have you know, certain types of phospholipids, certain proteins in them, and they float around almost like rafts. Okay, so how can it both raise and lower the melting point? Well, um, it, in a sense, it, it doesn't. But what it does is it, it would flatten this region out here in the curve, okay? So instead of being this huge, you know, very abrupt transition, it might look, the curve might look more like this, where you have a, a flatter line through this transition region, which allows the membrane to be more, um, you know, in the, in the correct amount of, of fluid-like, versus solid like in a physiological temperature range, right? Where here, if you're, you know, the temperature changes all of a sudden, your membrane's gonna drastically change uh, in phase. If this line was flatter, that cholesterol really makes happen um, that, that gives it a, a bigger temperature range where it has the, the optimum fluidity.
um, membrane dynamics. Uh, let's talk about how the membrane becomes asymmetric and how it stays asymmetric, right? You can, we can watch individual lipid molecules as they move what we would call laterally within a, a single bilayer. So if we you know, look at this one, it can move um, relative, uh, you know, either in, in two dimensions in, in a single bilayer. Okay, and this would be uncatalyzed lateral diffusion. That happens very fast, um, something like one micrometer per second within a leaflet. Okay. Okay, every component of the membrane exhibits some sort of asymmetry. Okay, lipids, the, there's outer and inner leaflets have different lipid composition. Proteins, as we mentioned, um, certain pro peripheral proteins are only associated with one side of the membrane. Uh, integral membrane proteins have different domains on different sides, so they, they insert in the membrane in a certain direction. Um, lipid modification of proteins targets the protein to a specific leaflet. Okay, so proteins are, are, are asymmetric. Carbohydrates, again, as we mentioned, they're only on the outside of the cell, so they're also asymmetric. Okay. Now, let's look at the, if we talked about a membrane, let's say this is the outside of the cell, flipping over to the inside of the cell. Okay, so flips from a leaflet to another are rare, right? So uncatalyzed, so we'd call this flip-flop diffusion. Um, they're, they're very rare because you have that polar head group has to go through the hydrophobic region of the membrane, and that's, you know, obviously pretty unfavorable. So the half-life of these, um, a, a, a lipid doing this is something in the order of days. So that's a very slow process. We have proteins called flipases in membranes that help facilitate this process. Okay, they, they catalyze um, transverse diffusion or, or the flipping, flip-flopping, if, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, um, some of them use ATP to move lipids against their concentration gradient. So an example of this flipase, right, it, it's using ATP to move a lipid um, and in this case, it's the phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine from the outer leaflet to the inner leaflet. And remember that phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylserine are, are more uh, concentrated on the inside leaflet, right? So that if you had a, your membrane form spontaneously, the the amount of different phospholipids on the outside and inside, they're going to be about the same. But you have these enzymes, these flipases, that can, can move the, the phosphatidyl ethanolamine and phosphatidyl serine to primarily the inside. Okay. So that's a flipase, moving something from the outside to the inside. A flopase would be the other direction. You're moving something from the inside to the outside. Okay. And in this case, it moves, um, it would move a, you know, like phosphatidylcholine from the inside to the outside. So it, they're more prominent on the outside, and, and this is why. Okay, and then there's other things called scramblases that will move uh, one lipid from the inside to the outside while it moves uh, another lipid from the outside to the inside. Okay, and so that, um, that scramblase um, probably don't really see any examples of that specifically. Okay. All right, so these, the flipase and flopase is, is really how the membranes can, can get their asymmetry and ma maintain their asymmetry. Okay. There are two uh, important experiments that, that show membrane dynamics that we'll talk about, and they're covered in the book. Okay, one is known as FRAP, or fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, and the other is just simply a single uh, molecule labeling experiment. Okay, so we'll go through uh, each of these uh, individually. Okay, so the first FRAP, okay, this is the overview. 
So first we take a cell in this experiment and we label the entire outside with a fluorescent probe that, that attaches to the, the head groups of these lipids. Okay, so the whole entire outside of this cell, it would be, if you viewed it under a fluorescent microscope, it would all light up. Okay, next you hit this uh, outside of a cell with an intense laser beam. Okay, so bam, you hit it with the laser. What that laser does, it, it, it's intense enough that it, it, it kills those fluorescent groups that were attached to the membrane where that laser hits. Okay, so you get uh, what known as a, a bleached area. Okay, so it, it removes all of that, that fluorescent color, that fluorescent molecule from that area where the laser hit. Then you wait a certain amount of time and you watch how the fluorescent grows back into that area. Okay, and the only way that that fluorescence can grow back in that area is that a lipid molecule that has a fluorescent, an intact fluorescent molecule, an active one, can, can diffuse back into that region. Okay, and by doing that, you, you can, they, that's how they measured the, the rate of diffusion of these lipids within a bilayer. And they could see that it, it was fluid. The, f the fluorescence did come back. It didn't just stay bleached. It actually came back. Okay? And the only way that could occur, again, is if those, those lipids are fluid and, and, and moving. Okay, the second experiment, uh, a single lipid was, was labeled fluorescently, and then you could watch, they watched its motion. Okay? And it would just, it would kind of bounce around, move around. And... It would stay sort of, you know, within a certain time frame, it would stay um, in a relatively enclosed region, and then all of a sudden it would make a jump, and then it would it would bounce around in sort of a different region, okay, and then it makes another jump, and it, it stays in this localized region for a while, and then it, there's another jump, and then it, it's in a, another region, and I kind of, I went backwards here, so this is where it started, and this is where it finished, but the uh, that doesn't really make uh, a difference here in the the results, right? The results showed that there were these these regions where the lipid could be more mobile, and it, it have to to wait a, a certain amount of time. It took longer to get to another region. Okay, so it wasn't just kind of moving around randomly all over the place. There was there was these defined regions it spent time in. And they, they kind of thought of this as sort of like um, there being a fence around each of these regions that the lipid had to take a while to jump over. Okay. All right, and that's where this idea of mem membrane rafts came from. Okay. Um, lip lipid rafts contain clusters of, of you know, certain phospholipids and, and in particular some some glycosphingolipids that have longer than usual tails okay what those do is it makes them they're more ordered okay and those lipid rafts you can think of as being more of a gel or solid phase because of that okay so those would be you know more of a solid region okay and they they have um, specific proteins that interact with, with those regions um, that, you know, kind of, you can think of sitting on that raft. So these, these more solid regions that we call rafts kind of float around in the, in the more liquid part of the membrane on the outside of them. Okay, and they carry certain proteins that need to be in close proximity to one another, and they do contain you know, slightly more cholesterol in those regions as well. Okay. And so those rafts are, are what you can think of as the fences in this experiment, right? The, that this lipid moving around in the fluid part is probably bouncing into some rafts or, or other integral membrane proteins around this that kind of restrict its motion. And then Every once in a while, it'll, it'll get past one of those and move to another region. 
uh, membrane fusion, membranes can fuse together, and, and that's without losing um, continuity, which is very important. If a membrane had to fuse and it, it, it let things leak out when it was doing that or, or leak in from the inside, that would obviously be very bad. Okay. Um, this fusion can be spontaneous or it can be mediated, controlled by proteins. Okay. And some examples of protein mediated fusion are uh, entry of viruses like the influenza virus, uh, influenza virus into a host cell, or the re release of neurotransmitters at nerve synapses. Right. And these, um, you won't need to know examples of these, but if you're interested, there's, you know, exocytosis is when something, uh, a vesicle from the inside of the cell is fuses with the plasma membrane and lets that out. Endocytosis is the opposite, where you have something from the outside of the cell kind of create a bubble in the plasma membrane, which then turns into a, a sort of vesicle on the inside, okay, viral infusion, infection, right? We've mentioned that before, that virus uh, connects with the membrane some, somehow um, it, via receptor or, or something that the virus is targeting that's on the outside of the cell, and then it, it fuses its membrane with the cell membrane and injects, you know, its, its, its DNA or RNA into the cell, okay? Um, sperm cells and egg cells uh, um, react by fusion, okay? And then, then there's other sort of internal fusion mechanisms as well, okay? Um, neurotransmitter release, is, that's another example of the protein-mediated uh, fusion and those are by you know the 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 snap and snare proteins and again this is outside of the scope of our class but if you're interested um, there's at least at one time fairly recently there was a lot of uh, research going on with these these snap and snare proteins okay uh, moving on to the third section transport across membranes okay, cell membranes are permeable permeable to small nonpolar molecules. Those can passively diffuse through the membrane. Um, passive diffusion of polar molecules is more difficult because it involves first the, the, the desolvation, the getting rid of the water uh, molecules that are associated with a polar molecule, right? So they have a very high activation barrier to get a polar membrane through a, a a, a mem excuse me, a polar molecule through a membrane. Okay. Uh, transport across membranes can be facilitated by proteins that provide alternative paths, diffusion paths. Okay, such proteins are called transporters or permeases. There's, uh, as we'll see here on the slide, six different types that we'll sort of talk about of transport. Okay. One is simple diffusion, okay? Simple diffusion. Um, this, in, in this case, we're looking at something from the outside of the cell diffusing in. Okay? These, this only happens simple diffusion um, non for nonpolar compounds, okay? And it's moving. It has to move down a concentration gradient, so that the concentration of S has to be greater. Uh, in this example, on the outside of the cell than the inside for it to, to, to passively diffuse through that membrane. Okay. Uh, facilitated diffusion is something that moves down an electrochemical gradient, okay? but it's, um, it can be a polar molecule now, but it's being helped across that, that membrane by a, a channel, um, a, a protein, that will, you know, help it, and we'll see an example of this in a second, it just helps lower the activation energy of that, that polar molecule moving across the, the nonpolar membrane. Okay. So those are diffusion, okay? The, the next examples that we'll see are, are active transport. So one is, is primary active transport, and that's where you have, you're moving against an electrochemical gradient. So in this example, S is going to be 
um, a higher concentration on the inside of the cell, but you're still moving it from the outside to the inside. Okay? And you do that using uh, ATP as that driving force. Okay, so you're using ATP um, to actively, the hydrolysis of ATP to actively push more of this um, S solute molecule inside, uh, or substrate molecule, I should say, inside. Okay. Secondary active transport, again, you're, you're moving um, S against an electrochemical gradient, but that's driven by something, some other molecule or ion moving down its electrochemical gradient. So in this example, this ion will be in much higher concentration outside of the cell. So it will want to move, there'll be an electromotive force to move it to the inside of the cell. And you're using, you're coupling that, that energy of this, you know, doing this spontaneously, this spontaneous movement of that ion with the non-spontaneous movement of um, your substrate going to from a low concentration into a higher concentration. Okay. Um, ion channels, okay, these are, these are passive um, things that an, an ion can move through that channel um, down its electrochemical gradient. Sometimes they're gated either by um, uh, most commonly by a ligand, so so they're, they'll be closed until a certain ligand binds to them, and then they open up to allow passage. Okay, and then something that we really won't ever see an example of in the class, but uh, ionophore mediated ion transport is when an ion would bind with another uh, more hydrophobic molecule, be brought into the cell, and then that ion would be released. But I don't, I, I've never seen an example of that. Um, in, in class. Okay. Right. So this is, um, if, if we're looking at a polar molecule, just simply diffusing through a membrane, what that would look like? Well, it has a sphere of hydration around that polar molecule. Okay. So the, the polar water molecules are interacting with that polar molecule. For that polar molecule to diffuse through the membrane, all those water molecules that are associating with it will just have to, you know, break off and, and you know, separate out. And that actually, if you're looking at the free energy of that, that to break those interactions of the water molecules, you pay a pretty high free energy price for that. Okay? And as you're, as you're going through the the membrane there with your polar molecule, that's also a pretty high free energy um, because your polar molecule can't interact with any of the hydrophobic groups. Okay. Then on the other side, again, you're going to need to recreate that, that hydration sphere. So the free energy of that process is shown here in red. And that, that delta G of the transition state is really high. What a transporter does is it when that's that that shell of hydration breaks there'll be um, amino acids here in this this channel that are polar that will interact with that polar molecule and what that does is it, it just lowers that that free energy required to lose the water molecules and and now you're not interacting you, you don't have this polar molecule um, going through a hydrophobic region, you have some other polar interactions it can, can have, and that, that drives down this, this transition state energy. And remember, when you lower transition state energy, what you're doing is you're speeding up the process, right? That in, in kinetics, that's, that's how enzymes work. So you're speeding up the transport. Something that would take, you know, could take, you know, years or longer for a polar molecule to break through that membrane can now be done in, in seconds or milliseconds. Okay. So there are three classes of these transport systems and they're based on the directionality to them. Um, one, you can have something called a uniport and that's when you're moving one molecule, one direction. Okay. Um, you can also have co-transport a couple different types of co-transport, and that's when you move two molecules at once. 
Okay, so a sim port is when you're moving two molecules in the same direction, and an antiport is when you have uh, two molecules moving in opposite directions. Right. Some specific examples of transporters that will that the book talks about that we'll highlight here. Um, one is aquaporins. Okay, what aquaporins do is they allow water passage through membranes and um, although that's not um, really obvious, they are really important to do that um, because if you have, um, in the case of like a bacteria cell, if its environment that, it, that it's in becomes um, more salty on the outside or less salty um, than the inside of its cell, that put, that would put a tremendous amount of osmotic pressure on that that cell and if it doesn't have a way to normalize the the osmotic pressure between the inside and the outside of the cell that cell could burst right and then the bacteria would die so one way that cells get around this is by aquaporins and these allow allow very rapid movement of water molecules through membranes and they do this in a number of ways, okay? And the book goes through some specifics here, okay? You have uh, these helices that are charged, that have a charge gradient on them, okay? And they actually have some, you know, negative charges uh, on the outside and a positive charge towards the inside. What that does is it, it gives electrostatic repulsion, so certain ion, the, an ion isn't going to be able to go through there because it's going to be repelled. Okay. It, this is referred to as the, the, a, the ARR selectivity filter. So the small AR is aromatic residue, um, and the big R is uh, the arginine positive charge residues. Okay, so that, those make the selectivity filter, so only water can pass through. Okay. They also contain uh, two NAP motifs, and, and those are used to, to move these water molecules single file through here. Okay, and that this is just the, the abbreviation of the amino acids and the motifs, so asparagine, alanine, proline motifs. And we see the asparagines um, in the two motifs here. And water molecules move through this very orderly and in single file. They move through these channels. And you can see that each step they have some hydrogen bonding interactions. And what, what else is interesting is that they, they go in with the oxygen you know, facing um, inside on the, the, the channel that they're going through. The oxygen molecule will face, in this case, it would be facing down. And then at a certain point here, it flips and reorients, and then, then the oxygen molecule would be facing up as it comes um, out this side. Okay, so there, there's some very specific things that this channel does with water. And when it does that, it can move these water molecules through very, very fast. Okay, and I, I, I included this uh, Wikipedia page, uh, Peter Agri was the one that um, did a lot of research on, on these aquaporins. And this uh, website, aquaporins.org, is something, if you're interested, you can look and find a lot of information about these. Right. Right. Another example of a, a transporter that we've mentioned before in this class um, was this in the bicarbonate cycle. OK. Um, in, in blood cells, you have the uh, carbon dioxide. It's, it's relatively nonpolar. It can diffuse through the membrane. Okay, once it's in there, an enzyme called carbonic and hydrase converts it into um, bicarbonate. And then you have this transporter in the membrane um, that can move bicarbonate to the outside. Uh, it actually works in both directions, but in this example, on this side, it's moving bicarbonate to the outside, and it does that uh, at the same time it moves a chloride ion from the outside to the inside. So this is would be a, a, an anti-porter. Okay, it's moving, um, it's it's doing co-transport to 
things at the same time, but they're moving in different directions. Right, if we look specifically now at active transport, okay, remember there are two types. We have primary active transport, and that's where we're moving one thing uh, in one direction, and it's using ATP to do that. Okay, so we're moving, in this case, S1 is lower concentration inside the cell, higher outside, but we're moving it to the, we're continuing to move it to the outside against its gradient by, by hydrolyzing ATP as our energy source. Okay. Secondary active transport is when you use um, the, the movement of one thing um, with its concentration gradient. So here S now is moving with its concentration gradient. And you're, we're doing that along at the same time we're moving um, uh, something else, S2, against its concentration gradient. Okay, So this would be an example of a, a SIM port because it's moving two things in the same direction. Okay. Oftentimes, this secondary active transport, how is it, it generating the, the concentration gradient of S1 that's needed to move S2? Well, there's another channel for S1 that's using ATP. Okay, so you're consuming ATP to pump S1 outside of the cell, right, against its gradient. So you can use it coming back in, in this SIM port to import S2. Okay, so this, that would be secondary active transport. Okay, okay ion channels, uh, we'll be talking more about ion channels. Um, they maintain gradients for active transport. Okay. Um, an example here is the potassium ion channel. And what you'll notice is they have, uh, on, on the outside, they have uh, helices that are, are um, there's a charge gradient on them. Okay. And their, their negative side is facing more towards the inside here. Okay, and that negative charge is going to help stabilize the positively charged potassium ion that's going through that channel. Okay, so that's one uh, way they, they, they're specific. The other way in which they're specific is the, the channel size here is very specific for the size of the potassium ion. And if you look down the outside of it, um, down the middle of it, you'll see that right that that channel there is is really um, anything bigger than that potassium ion isn't going to fit. Okay, and, and other things that are smaller than it aren't going to get these the same interactions. Uh, and they're specifically the interactions come from the backbone carbonyl oxygens that are facing in this channel, and they act to um, as a way to sort of hydrate these potassium ions, right? Because when they go into that channel, they have to lose the water molecules that are coordinating with them. And those interactions are, are replaced by the interaction with the backbone uh, carbonyl oxygens when they're inside the channel. And those, the spacing of those is such that they only really interact with, with potassium precisely. Right. And there's other ion channels, right? There's um, um, sodium and, ca and calcium ion channels as well that, that act in kind of a similar fashion. And this is, table is showing you um, the certain channels there are. There are many of these channels. Uh, and they, when you have a, one of these genes that are affected by a mutation, there, there, there are certain diseases that are involved. And Probably the most famous one, uh, uh, ion channel defect, would be the, the chloride ion channel, which re it results in cystic fibrosis. Okay, so next time we're mo we'll move on to chapter 12, uh, and we'll, we'll cover really kind of the first part of chapter 12, um, sections 1 and 2. Uh, chapter 12 is dealing with biosignaling. Um, We'll talk about the general features and then talk about G protein coupled receptors. And then we'll jump to section 10, which 
uh, it covers a, a specific G protein coupled receptor, um, and that is involved in, in vision. Okay, and a reminder: our third in class activity will be uh, October twenty second. So make sure you you show up for that class meeting.